Hello and welcome. My name is Blake Andrea. Thanks for visiting. Um, I hope this is the start of a series of explanation about supply chain management. I've worked in various supply chain management roles over the past 20 years at both large and small businesses, and I have a passion for helping people to achieve uh, solid supply chain execution. My ultimate goal here is to make these concepts accessible for anyone who wants to learn them. I have some ideas on how to proceed after this, but I'm really looking for some feedback from anyone that might be viewing this to tell me where they could use some more help. And literally any reason is good enough for me. This very subject came from a comment on LinkedIn um, and it just was a good opportunity for me to kind of take it from there. So it could be that you're hoping to more clearly communicate or articulate some of these ideas to your colleagues or maybe you want to provide more value to your organization, or perhaps you're looking for a way to convince your boss that there is value in incorporating these concepts. Whatever it is, I'm happy to help you in that journey. And the first step is to understand these concepts. So send me those ideas. I'm going to have my LinkedIn page in the description, and you can feel free to connect with me there or leave a comment here. Um, in, in this presentation, we're going to cover the strategic disciplines that help to guide sound supply chain management, or SCM for short. Uh, keep in mind that these concepts and measurements outlined here are generalities. Each one of these subjects can be taken much further than you can reasonably even define. The goal here is to simply provide context and increase your understanding for wherever your need may be. The fundamental goal of supply chain management is to work within the constraints of service level, cash, and cost. Service level is measured and recognized by dividing the number of on-time orders by the total orders. Cash, in the case of SCM, is measured through inventory, and cost refers to operational costs. And what this triangle represents is the idea that an organization needs to balance these constraints to help meet its operating income goals or its profit target. So a good example within this is, hey, um, my organization requires 98% uh, uh, service. Okay, that's fine. Um, if, you provide, if you need to provide that 98% service, you just need to know that that's going to cost you more cash than what, say, an 80% service level would. And it's going to cost you more from an operation standpoint because you're setting up smaller runs and you're being more reactive to the information that's coming in from your customers. That's okay. It's just you need to be um, deliberate about how you set it up. And again, you can still try and balance it out so you can optimize profit within those constraints. Forecasting is an attempt to use available inputs, such as what has happened in the past and what the impact of quantifiable future events are likely to be to project what is likely going to happen at a future date. More simply put, you take what you know and make an educated guess about what the most likely outcome will be. The most universally understood application of this is a weather forecast. While it the outputs are different within business operations. The concepts are the same. Weather forecasts take data like wind speed, direction, temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure along with regional wear, uh, radars to make assumptions on what is going to happen in their region over the next several days. So you get this output here that says, hey, on Monday, we think it'll be 76 degrees and sunny. On Thursday, it'll be 70 degrees and it will be rainy. And as you can see here, the farther out you go, the less accurate the forecast gets. And forecast accuracy is a huge subject that we can go into at some point in time, but just know the general concept here is that the farther you go out, the less accurate it's going to be. For business operations, the inputs and outputs are generally more streamlined because primarily what you put in is what you get out. Depending on the needs of your organization, you're going to have one or two outputs 
revenue and or finished goods units sold. In my experience, it's always been both. Um, this graph lays out in the simplest terms what a forecast would look like and where the data would come from. In this case, we simply take the average of the sales revenue and units sold and average them out. So seven points of reference each month of January through August equal an average of $260. So that would be the forecast moving forward. The same thing applies for units to arrive at an average of 104 units a month. Um, there can and likely will be other outputs derived from here, like margin and price or a number of other derivations, but that can be the focus of another time um, and can get into some more complex ways that you can, that you can work with some of these outputs. Uh, the other thing here to note is that you can, it doesn't always have to be just a straight line forecast. Oftentimes you're using things like seasonality. So uh, a really easy one to understand here is um, when are you going to likely sell the most amount of pumpkins in the U.S.? Well, you're going to sell the most amount of pumpkins around Halloween, right? So um, sure, you can use it for, there's people that use pumpkin throughout the year, um, pumpkin pies and that sort of thing at different points in time. but um, generally where you're going to see the most use of it is sometime around fall. So you're going to see a huge spike in fall and then you're not going to see very much demand for pumpkins for the rest of the year. So that's what you would that's how you would consider seasonality. If you look at it here on this one, it does look like there is some kind of pattern and there are models that can account for that. But just for this, just to get a, a, an understanding of the concept here, we decided to just use a straight line average. Why is a centralized approach to forecasting important? Your organization uh, likely already has one or more functions that are forecasting at least informally. Purchasing is possibly looking at what components they have used in the past 12 weeks, while operations is looking at what they did the same time last year to determine how many people they need for the next month. And finance is looking at the past year to determine what they are going to need for cash for the next year. Each one of these time frames come with a different estimate. So purchasing buys their components, and while they have enough, operations doesn't have enough people available to meet the demand of the customers and finance is squeezed on cash flow because they anticipated a lower spend on component inventory. This can be avoided by starting from one number or a single version of truth. This can be accomplished through consensus forecasting, which allows multiple areas of the organization to have a say in the forecast, or by giving over authority to the forecasting function exclusively. So there are pros and cons that can be discussed at another time. But what's most important is that there is one output. Inventory management is the practice that ensures that an organization has the right amount of inventory to meet service requirements while not tying up cash unnecessarily. This should not be confused with inventory control, which confirms if you physically have the inventory and are cycling through it appropriately with practices like FIFO or LIFO. That's a whole nother discipline that sits better within the operations department. So I'm not going to be covering that. This is all about finding the right balance of inventory to support the business requirements. Why is inventory management important? Inventory management is important because it helps the organization um, allocate assets in the most optimal way. If an organization doesn't have enough inventory, then it's going to miss out on sales in the short term and potentially harm their brand value in the long term, which will lead to more loss of a sales if they can't be trusted as a reliable supplier. If an organization has too much inventory, that means they aren't able to invest that cash elsewhere to do things like develop new products or services that might provide additional streams of income in the future. There's also a carrying cost to inventory in a number of different ways. As one example, shelf space may cost money because you need to rent additional space to physically house all the extra inventory. Um, or to use or to launch a new product, instead of using your cash, you have to borrow 
and then the interest against the loan will cost money. There are more consequences than just these, but these are really some of the common ways that you see that play out. So again, to go through it, it's you increase capital liquidity, decrease risk, increase profitability, and increase service with solid inventory management. What is demand planning? Um, it, it really is managing forecast expectations versus the reality of what's actually happening. So let me start this one by saying that this phrase is often interchanged with forecasting. As someone that has worked strictly in forecasting and directed planning departments, let me explain why I view these as separate operations. As discussed earlier, for me, forecasting is a pure attempt at estimating the finished good unit and or revenue. As we will conclude, I'll explain the shareholder matrix, but the point is that a centralized forecast interacts with a broader section of the organization than the demand plan. When I hear demand planning, I think about how to manage the variation of forecast within your supply chain, whereas a forecast will interact with product development and finance much more extensively. For example, the forecast indicated that we needed 100 dollhouse chairs to be completed for the month of November, so we have inventory to build 100 chairs and we have labor available to build to, to assemble those 100 chairs. As customer orders start to come in for November, however, they are higher than 100, say 120 chairs, which means that the plan will show that we're 20 units short in both inventory and with labor capacity. Demand planning helps to coordinate these shortages by helping, helping to plan around them. So in this case, you ask a few employees to plan to work some overtime for that schedule, and you have purchasing expedite some additional supply to close that gap. Now, why is demand planning so important? Demand planning is important because it provides feedback needed for more accurate forecasts and also allows for the successful execution of product or service delivery to your customer. It also allows you to do so in the most efficient way possible and thereby be more profitable. Let's build on the last example. So as a buyer, you need to expedite the components to, um, to make the finished goods. Let's say in this case, um, we need more seats to complete our chairs. Um, our supplier can expedite those, but there's a cost associated because it's a smaller run. So normally we purchase monthly, uh, purchase monthly in batches of 100 at 50 cents a piece. We only need 20 though to fill the remaining demand for this month. So a run of 20 will cost us $1.20 a piece because of the cost of setup for the supplier. So obviously that's going to reduce your profitability um, per, uh, per unit that you sell. However, it would only be 70 cents a piece if we did a run of 40. As a buyer, the question they would ask through the demand planning process would be if we think that buying those 40 would be a safe buy or are we going to sit on that excess inventory for a while? Let's say in this case that forecast bias um, always shows us underestimating the forecast by about 20%. So essentially what happened this month with being 20 pieces short happens every month. Because you have that data, you can feel confident that you can purchase that run of 40 and we will move through it in a reasonable time. There are a few other actions that you should take coming out of this as well as an organization, like adjusting the forecast if that's possible or increasing inventory to account for variation. And those are some of the longer term follow-ups that would come out of the process. But in the immediate term, the, the, the ideas that you would take would be, okay, what do I need to do to close these gaps to fill these orders right now? And that's how demand planning helps. So this final illustration represents how standard business functions might interact with each of the concepts that we've covered. Please note that each organization may require involvement in different areas than what is presented here. 
but this will cover the most likely relationships that you would see within an organization, particularly when it comes to, um, you know, manufacturing uh, and assembly uh, organizations. Uh, this, this is really here to help set your expectations about who will be engaged in this process. Uh, for example, you can go to marketing and explain that you use their inputs to increase the forecast um, that and now the organization has a problem with having too much inventory because their assumptions didn't come to fruition. But don't expect them to give you any actionable feedback. They don't play in the inventory management role. In fact, in this case, it's likely just to create a, an adversarial interaction and de decrease their interaction, um, their engagement in the forecasting process in the future. So what you really need to do is you really need to consider how can you go and meet, meet each one of these stakeholders where they are and where they operate to get the best results. As you can see, there will likely be the most heavy involvement in these disciplines from operations and purchasing. The other thing that you'll notice is that forecasting will be the one thread that weaves its way through much of the organization. Like we said, it connects with a broad swath of organizations in a company if it's a centralized forecast. Each function is going to differ in how they interact there. Um, you know, some will be really involved giving inputs and some will utilize the outputs. Some functions will be more interested in what the long-term outlook is and ignore the short-term projections and vice versa. But the point is the forecast should be that one unifying thread and the thing that aligns business operations. Again, it's that single version of truth. So where do we go from here? So we've covered a lot in this presentation, but in each one of these, there are a number of different areas that we can go further. At the very least, I would like to go further uh, into how to execute on some of these concepts, but I'm interested in your take. If there is an area where you would like to know more, or if there is a term that I use that you'd like a little more context, leave a message in the comments, or again, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, additionally, if you could like and subscribe and share, that would be helpful for me to continue to create content. The more engagement I get, the more likely I am to continue on, because that's a good indicator that people want and need help with these subjects. Outside of that, thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day.